Hey friends, I'm in slow-mo mode today. I'm on drugs to deal with back pain. I think I still have enough brain to deal with Jordan Peterson fans though, so I found this comment on last week's video and thought it would be pretty easy to handle, even with half my brain tied behind my back, or whatever inept phrase Kent Hovind uses. The issue is that I ripped into Jordan Peterson for his foolish idea that if he takes the right kind of drugs, he can turn his brain into a microscope and see molecules of DNA. He presented no evidence that he can do this. I guess he needs to learn that facts don't care about your feelings. Anyway, I got a surge of stupid traffic from this. People logging in to tell me that drugs are wonderful, that I didn't understand the meta concept Peterson was discussing, calling me stupid, that I was missing the context behind his claim, etc., etc., etc. They were trying so hard to rationalize the patent idiocy of Peterson's claims. I am so sorry for them. And of course, one of the more common arguments was an ad hominem. And surprise, I know what that means. Unlike most of the people throwing the Latin around, it does not mean insulting someone. It means using a different unrelated component of my character to dismiss my ideas on the subject at hand. Here's an example of someone announcing that because I am a so-called justice, social justice warrior, I can just ignore what I said about Peterson's magic DNA eyes. They say, I'm not going to talk much about Peterson, but here's my problem. P.Z. Myers is supposed to be a scientist, and yet he lets social justice, which has nothing to do with science, leak in. Ah, there's a remarkable assertion. Science, or capital S science, can't have anything to do with social justice. Actually, it can, if conditions have empirical measurable consequences, so that's kind of nonsensical. Even if it didn't, scientists are human beings, and we can care about whether other people are being treated fairly. This isn't the objection he thinks it is. But he rushes to tell me he's a good person anyway. I helped a transgender person overseas and helped feed him and fix his bike. So this isn't about hate or anything, but pronouns and having many sexes is against the scientific data. Oh, the I have a black friend argument. It's very nice that they have helped a transgender person, but now I'm confused. He used the pronoun him. So are they a transgender man, or are you misgendering a transgender woman? I only ask because you say pronouns are against the scientific data, and there he goes using pronouns like a non-scientist, or, you know, a normal human being. Uh, they continue digging their hole. It's more like a problem with the mind itself, and social justice should not be mixed with science. Uh, so, capital S scientists shouldn't study the mind or society? Peterson is a psychologist. Maybe you should have a conversation with him about how he can't claim to be a scientist. I'd agree, by the way, but psychologists can be legitimate scientists, you know. There's a whole category called the social sciences, which includes psychology and sociology. Who are you to define what science is or isn't? But let's wrap this one up. This is why I'm upset, because if you are a scientist, you should have nothing to do with stuff that's not science at all. It's more pseudoscience than actual real silence. science. Disappointed in you, PZ. I thought you would be better than that. This is really shameful, and I think that's worse than whatever Peterson is going on about. coffee to get through this. Oh, that was stupid. Okay, here's what I find annoying myself, and it's something I see a lot of in the comments, especially when I say anything about transgender issues. The dumbest, most ignorant people show up to tell me that I don't know the science. They know the science far better than I do. But all they really know is a few bits and pieces of some poorly understood genetics they recite to bolster their prior biases. They also ignore the injection of politics or sociology that they agree with 
into the pseudoscience that his preferred characters, like Peterson, will babble about. It's ridiculous that he finds a scientist advocating for social justice to be more objectionable than a mad, deluded kook promoting hateful bigotry. But I'm trying to figure out why he thinks scientific data is against pronouns or, more, or a more complex perspective on sex. And I think I know how they come to this conclusion. And it's a common problem in genetics education. Too often, early genetics instruction in the public schools begins with Mendel and ends with Mendel, leaving students thinking that genetics is a relatively simple and deterministic process. I suspect that many of the listeners of this video think they know the basics of genetics. That there are dominant and recessive genes, they are sorted and recombined in meiosis and fertilization, and which one you express is a binary decision. The canonical story of the Y chromosome fits perfectly with this simplistic idea. Y is the male chromosome. If you inherit one, you are male, and if you don't get one, you're female, and that's it. That's the problem. Mendel's work was a preliminary insight into possible mechanism. His results from pea plants were useful and interesting, and once they were rediscovered, promised a way to analyze inheritance with mathematics, probability theory, and statistics. If you stop at Mendel, though, you miss all the interesting complications that emerge later, and you acquire a primitive and rigid notion of how inheritance works. I've been calling it creeping Mendelism. It's the way a few experiments with pea plants have crept into the public consciousness and taken over. I'm not the only one who has noticed. Here's a paper that was published a few years ago that says the same thing. 21st century biology rejects genetic determinism, yet an exaggerated view of the power of genes in the making of bodies and minds remains a problem. What accounts for such tenacity? This article reports an exploratory study suggesting that the common reliance on Mendelian examples and concepts at the start of teaching in basic genetics is an illimitable source of support for determinism. Undergraduate students who attended a standard Mendelian Approach University course in introductory genetics on average showed no change in their determinist views about genes. By contrast, students who attended an alternative course inspired by the work of a critic of early Mendelism, W.F.R. Weldon, 1860 to 1906, uh, replaced an emphasis on Mendel's peas with an emphasis on developmental contexts and their role in bringing about phenotypic variability were less determinist about genes by the end of the teaching. Improvements in both the new Weldonian curriculum and the study design are in view for the future. Okay. This is not the same as saying that Mendel was totally wrong. Mendel defined a simple starting point, but the progress of genetics since has since eclipsed his preliminary ideas. I suspect that most of you are wondering what in your education is obsolete. So let me go over in the most basic way what Mendelism says. Mendel worked backwards to infer the existence of what he called unit factors and gametes. So an organism has a set of traits which have illustrated some colored solids. In Mendel's case, he identified a set of traits in pea plants, such as the color of the seeds or flowers, or the height of the plant, or other properties of the plant. Then he did a set of carefully defined crosses, followed by meticulous accounting of the progeny to infer correctly that each plant had pairs of alleles for each trait, and that some alleles were dominant, that is always expressed, or recessive, that is not expressed if a dominant allele was present and that they were distributed to progeny randomly. Does this sound familiar? It should. You might have gotten this in basic biology classes when you were about 12. The one thing you may have learned beyond what Mendel knew is that these genes were encoded in a molecule called DNA. The unfortunate implication that you may also have absorbed is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between genes and traits. That's the problem. When your education is arrested at that point, you start thinking in terms of genes for X, where X is cancer, or obesity, or eye color, or sexual preferences. That means you don't know about all the cool stuff that comes out after that. There isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. Each gene contributes to multiple phenotypic characters, a phenomenon called pleiotropy, 
and each phenotypic property is established by multiple genes. They are multigenic. People are now talking about the idea of omnigenicity, or that every gene makes some contribution to every trait. This means that the idea of a gene for a specific purpose mostly doesn't work. Another example, you can't say that a Y chromosome makes you a male. The Y chromosome has one strong effect in switching uh, genes off and on in autosomes, the other genes in the chromosome set, and even the X chromosome that are essential for male development. The molecular biology revolution from the 1950s also tells us that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is exported into the cytoplasm. Furthermore, most, but not all, of the RNA is translated into proteins. This is the only way genes can act, by sending out molecular proxies in the form of RNA and protein that do the actual work of the cell. To wreck those nice linear genes to phenotype arrows further, the cytoplasm is a stew pot of interactions and activity. Proteins are communicating with and modifying the activity of other proteins and are feeding back to regulate the expression of genes. They also modulate themselves with feedback and feedforward mechanisms. You simply can't draw a straight line from a gene to its effect on the phenotype. There are always side effects. It may also be that the mutant feature that leaps to the eye of the geneticist is one of the minor effects for that gene. And there is a more important primary effect that we just don't notice. Finally, there is the immense effect of the environment, a parameter Mendel didn't even consider. The expression of genes is affected by environmental factors and also our biology feeds back and modifies the environment. What this means is that genes do not determine fate in any simple way. Every phenomenon, such as cardiovascular disease in this diagram, are the product of a causal web, of which genetics is an important but not the only part. Mendel had intentionally executed a thorough job of experimental reductionism, eliminating all the variables that might have affected his results other than the ones he chose to test, which is good practice in a controlled experiment, but it also artificially exaggerates the effects of that one variable. And that's how I end up with a bunch of commenters who insist that they know the science better than I do. The first simplest knowledge they have about genetics is instilled in them an absolute moral certainty that genes are deterministic and that anyone who talks about complexity and subtlety and the importance of other factors must be a bad scientist. They've got everything backwards. Anyway, now you know where I'm coming from. Uh, maybe you also understand a little better why the people who claim genetic differences drive differences between the sexes or between races or between nations uh, are so important. They've got a cartoon version of genetics in their heads. Okay. Well, that's enough. Hey, did, did I do okay for an old geezer on painkillers? I think I bumbled my way through it okay. Um, if I, didn't, if I didn't, ask me questions in the comments and I'll try to untangle any confusion. Or you can join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Myers and get a hotline directly to me. Okay, I also hand out my email fairly freely, so I go, guess you don't need to join to contact me. That's all, everyone. Talk to you later.